Thank you, sir. Yeah. All right. So uh, my good friend, Mr. Bond, um, he, uh, he lied to you. He said he didn't like change. Bunk. I will tell you, this man has made a lot of money off change, and uh, he's pretty good at it. So I wouldn't buy the uh, forget, uh, uh, not 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 enjoying change. Me, uh, I thrive on change. Change is uh, is my business because when things change, people usually have to do something quick about it, and that usually involves mergers and acquisitions. And hello, that's where I step in. So um, I guess uh, I'm uh, I'm here to speak about. Um, the market evolution to premium programmatic. So what I want to do is, um, is sort of set the stage with a little bit of uh, conversation about where we are now around programmatic and some of the players and some of the challenges, much of which at least uh, theoretically uh, John alluded to with his supply, demand, and, uh, and lobster. We're going to have to get a, a Luma-themed lobster. Um, and, uh, and, then, and then talk about um, actually how uh, it actually works from a premium programmatic standpoint and what we're most likely, or what we think will help them happen uh, in the future and why this isn't uh, something that's new. But I guess, I guess the first question to ask would be of the Sanobi folks and, and uh, MediaMath and, and John is, wh why uh, did he invite a banker to speak at a marketing event? Um, after all, uh, we're part of a class of people that doesn't have the best reputation. Turns out, if we have audio on here, if you were to do a Google search and type in investment bankers are, uh, there's audio here, please, we could turn on the audio, that'd be great. Um, this is what you get. I, I swear to God, you can do this, go back to your desks and, um, and, and do this, and that is exactly uh, what comes up. Now, uh, you know, we're, uh, so my whole mission here today is to uh, try, and, uh, try and fight against that, that trend. Um, and uh, here's my uh, um, Twitter handle, but don't follow me yet. Uh, what I would suggest is that at the end of this presentation, you've been both informed and entertained a little bit, then, then fine. Uh, then you can follow me. So I'll hold that out as a challenge. Can someone confirm we've got audio here, please? Thank you. Um, so uh, one of the things, one of the reasons why um, it is important to not necessarily take the traditional uh, Wall Street view is that, um, you know, on Wall Street, you, you, if, you, if you really want to be value-added, you have to unlearn some of the things they teach you on Wall Street. Uh, I remember my first days at Solomon Brothers. The first day they told us about um, something called the red suit rule. And the red suit rule stands for the proposition that if the client wants a red suit, sell them a red suit. Don't tell them they would look ridiculous in a red suit. Don't get in the way of revenue. Just sell them the damn red suit. Well, we at Luma believe we take a much more strategic approach, and we think this doesn't make any sense at all. So we're decidedly against the red suit rule. After all, there's not that many people that look good in a red suit. <coughs> of course, there's always exceptions. Um, so uh, the evolution uh, you know, of programmatic, y you may or may not have seen this slide before. Um, a lot have, uh, but, uh, but I do think uh, we are at a unique point in time in the gestation um, of the evolution of, uh, of, uh, of our industry, where w we have seen uh, a transformation of how media was bought and sold between direct relationships. Then 15 years ago, we had the ad networks. Starting about seven or eight years ago, the advent of the exchange, the DSP, the SSP, in other words, the whole programmatic world. And, and that was all well and good. Transparency goes up, efficiency goes up. And as you've probably seen from a lot of the activity, um, you know, there's uh, there, there those newer types of companies, the the you know data rich you know one on one marketing opportunity that programmatic brings to the table has uh, has been a plus but as john alluded uh, kind of early days really just sort of addressing the uh, the bottom of the barrel um, and i think it has uh, w we're at a stage now where because of some developments taking place on video and some large capable players uh, in video uh, that want to make sure that that world uh, uh, moves to programmatic. 
uh, as well as uh, some uh, interesting new technologies um, on the um, on the display side. In fact, quite frankly, it doesn't really matter whether it's you know display or, or mobile or video that are actually bringing tools to be able to create a programmatic like ecosystem for more uh, premium um, inventory. And um, you know, like I said, um, I came in like a, a lot of people uh, like these uh, I never for, uh, so up to. Um, I know that it's an image that will haunt you. Um, 1.8 million views on these damn things from 175 uh, countries. So I, you know, it turns out there's only 196 countries in the world. I I looked at the list of 21 uh, countries that have not viewed or downloaded Illumiscape, and it's basically you know the axis of evil. It's uh, North Korea and Syria and and Iran and um, the Democratic Republic of Congo, the People's Republic of Congo, you know, all those kind of, you know, uh, popular places. I'm, I'm pretty much uh, thinking I'm gonna get a summer intern to go around and just sort of make sure we get 100% ubiquity. Um, but, uh, but, but again, I think the popularity relates to uh, the fact that we now have a map, we now have an opportunity to sort of, you know, map out the space. And so today I think what we wanna do is take that to why this is interesting from a programmatic standpoint. And one um, other uh, note, and that is you, you have probably no doubt heard uh, uh, time or ad nauseum about the lack of brand spend in the digital channel. And certainly um, the digital channel and in particular the, the, the programmatic or the high, you know, sort of data infused technologies around intermediate and media buying um, have served uh, the direct response uh, uh, aspect of, of marketers well. In fact, I would argue very well. Um, you know, the perfection of the algorithms, the opportunity to hit people up near the bottom of the funnel where they didn't complete a purchase. You know, it's, it's wonderful, it's great, and that's growing. But you hear, whether it's the IAB or on the marketing organizations, lament. I mean, tangible lament about the lack of brand advertising and the lack of investments of technology companies that support brand advertising. Now, there's two elements going on here, right? On one hand, you've got, you've got, the, uh, you've got the interface, you've got the channel. You know, is digital even set up to do brand advertising? Are people, um, do people make, do, do brand impressions get made um, in, a, in a digital context? You know, I've pointed out that, um, you know, put a hands, show of hands for anybody who's uh, had a, a banner ad make you cry. Uh, certainly a 30, 30 second spot can make you cry. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, outdoor billboards can do a very effective job, even, even print, but you know, have you seen a banner that's made you cry? Uh, you know, I'm gonna guess no. Um, and so there are some questions around the channel. Uh, there are, uh, I think, real opportunities Given the one-to-one -one nature of the, the data and what we can discern about which audience is viewing ads to actually be able to move up funnel and have a more premium uh, uh, experience for the uh, messaging interface. I like to call it messaging, not advertising, because of this advent of content marketing, which is so uh, important in this world. And I think that is a huge opportunity for brand advertising. Now. Uh, so one is the one is the venue or the channel. Second is money. Uh, venture capitalists have not been as forthcoming with uh, funding for companies that are either addressing bringing technology scale to creative or to more sort of premium uh, solutions. Why? Because venture capitalists like big returns, and you get big returns when you get a big exit multiple. Uh, uh, on your, well, I mean, you can scale fast and you can get a big exit multiple. And you get those uh, when you have a business that has high operating leverage. And traditionally, the notion has been, and it's largely been, you know, close to the truth, so there's a there there, and that is that the, you know, high value, premium, storytelling, creative, the, all the sort of uh, things that you associate with brand advertising have lower operating leverage. And if they have lower operating leverage, then companies pursuing those are not gonna grow as fast or as big, and therefore the VCs will not get their exit. If there is not a better tee up for premium programmatic, I don't know what is. 
So, um, like I said, here's the here's the venture capitalists and all these companies that um, you know are are exploring options as it relates to the public markets, right? Um, so there's at least 16. There's probably another five companies that are in the pipeline and pursuing IPOs. And since Rocket Fuel and subsequently Criteo, uh, sorry, Criteo, and um, and and I would add uh, the continued success of Facebook and Twitter. Because let's remember, those are social media B2C companies with huge audiences. But the reality is, the, the reasons why their stocks have taken off, and they've really taken off, I mean, Facebook's up over 80 billion in the last year, is because of performance advertising technology. So, so I think those are uh, good, uh, good hallmarks of the progress of this space. Again, most of this at the bottom of the funnel. So with all these companies, looking to go public, you know, we sort of did a, a, an analysis that looked at, well, what are investors looking for? And this is uh, going to be important when we talk about some of the limitations and parameters on premium uh, programmatic and the opportunity. We believe investors are looking uh, like what they look for in any company, which is a great business model that's got growth, Operating leverage and predictability. And okay, fine, you can add a fourth one to the extent um, there is some uh, potential takeover premium um, in the stock, maybe some strategic value. So let's, look at, let's take a look at these three things. Well, growth. Uh, Data-driven uh, uh, digital marketing is definitely on the rise. It tends to be a function. You got population growth. GDP is uh, then a function on top of that. Ad spend is, is, is pro projected to be double um, the, uh, the GDP growth for 2014. Digital, three times the total uh, ad market in growth here in the US. Display higher than digital, because digital is inclusive of search, uh, which is not growing um, as fast. And then finally, programmatic, growing at a 50% growth rate. Bear in mind, this thing has been growing at uh, you know, 75 to 125 percent for the last three years. So we came from a world of nothing in programmatic in 2009. Not nothing. I sold Invite Media. They did 1.5 million dollars in 2009 net revenue. So basically nothing in 2009. All in the fourth quarter, by the way. Um, to to where we are today with a multi-billion-dollar industry that's growing at a compound rate of 50 uh, percent. So, so check the box on growth, right? Programmatic has definitely got that. Let's talk about operating leverage. I think there is a clear association between scale and automation, and we've seen it in terms of the evolution of some of the uh, pay models of, uh, of how people are selling media, and the examples are pretty clear, right? You've got the traditional publishers, the portals, selling largely on a CPM. By the way, lots of exceptions to this, but uh, calling out generalizations. Google invented the CPC, so, so, and, and that took off uh, in spades, and a heck of a lot more operating leverage to a CPC business than a CPM business, because in part, for the advertisers, you were giving them uh, performance. They didn't have to think so much about the marketing spend. Enter Rocket Fuel. Uh, performance advertising at scale utilizing sophisticated algorithms and not charging the publisher unless they received some kind of benefit. So CPA. And look at them. I mean, their growth rate, they've just announced they're two quarters out as a public company, and despite some um, haters in the market, I don't know why ad, the ad tech industry does that, um, these guys have done fantastically well, and my prediction is they will continue uh, to do well, uh, focused on customer acquisition with a performance advertising model. But even better than that has been the performance of Facebook with cost per install mobile uh, app-related ads in the last year. This has exploded. When you see the graphs of a quarterly uh, revenue for Facebook, and quite frankly for Twitter, but let's focus on Facebook for a second, of the last you know, seven or eight quarters of mobile ad spend, first of all, it's almost all uh, uh, going after uh, cost per install. So it's apps trying to get installs and games trying to get installs and spending through Facebook to drive that. Um, and, and so you want to talk about operating leverage, you know, that's a company that'll do, what they did, four and a half uh, billion in advertising, will likely do seven billion next year. So 
a huge, huge operating leverage. So we do know that programmatic uh, mechanisms can add a lot of um, operating leverage. And, and finally, predictability. And look, predictability is not an adjective, um, or is it an adverb, um, that, um, that, that, that one normally associates with advertising. Advertising is uh, campaign-based, batch process, IOs, and the, and the whole lot of it. However, um, think about it at the other extreme. Think about um, a truly bidded uh, uh, digital uh, media uh, marketplace, search. Search is, a, is a, a perfectly bidded marketplace where there are no search marketers that think about every month, should we or should we not buy keywords to the efficient frontier? You absolutely buy keywords because I would suggest that the value proposition of search advertising is like as follows. Google says to the marketer, give me $100, I'll give you $200. Uh, okay. Uh, give me $100, I'll give you $199. Fine. Give me $100, I'll give you $198. That continues until it's, give me $100, I'll give you $99. And the marketer says, stop. And, and every month after month, people spend to the efficient frontier of their keyword buys. In fact, it's so uncorrelated or non-correlated with, with uh, the economy or the opportunity. When we, saw, um, when we saw the recession in 2009, search advertising spiked up, not down. Why is that? Because unlike the advertising of more traditional uh, realms where we like hope it works and it's you know, kind of discretionary and it starts and it stops, search is not considered a discretionary expense. In fact, it moves up the income statement. It's more cost of goods sold. In fact, some might even argue uh, for lead gen businesses, it's a revenue driver. So spend money on search and you will get more sales, whereas some other formats don't quite have that direct correlation. Okay, so fine. We got growth, we got operating leverage, and we got predictability, uh, or at least some, some notion of predictability, which is why we sort of came up with this color by numbers thought piece to say, hey, if all these companies are going public and they have all these different business models, how does the public investor ferret out who's doing what? Well, um, we suggested that uh, they be broken out into categories. So we put four categories, Ad Network 1.0, 2.0, programmatic, and SaaS, with a footnote that not very many companies that mediate, intermediate media purchasing are, actually have SaaS models. That's probably more of a data play for, for a monthly fee. But it turns out when you look at the public companies and then you apply valuation vectors that represent each of these categories, well, maybe some of them start to make a little bit uh, more sense. And hopefully we've got a, you know, a framework, again, this is not exact science, but a framework as to uh, where things will go in terms of some of these new offerings. Why am I telling you all this preamble before getting to the premium programmatic stuff? Because we're gonna have the combination of this growth, operating leverage, and predictability that programmatic delivers, along with the huge total addressable market of brand advertising that I think will require a premium focus. You combine those two and you have a winner. So um, yeah, we got 20 uh, private companies. That, this is an amazing stat. 20 private companies that average over 300 million in revenue that are growing at a median growth rate of 60%. So when I said growth and scale, I meant it. Um, uh, and, and by the way, you know, this, is not, um, uh, this has not been lost on the strategic uh, buyer uh, universe. This is our strategic buyer, uh, Lumiscape, that lays out 175 companies that are uh, most likely to be buyers of digital media properties, grouped by type, by propensity. There's a lot of ways it's grouped. Um, you can note that there are consumer companies that are on the right, uh, enterprise companies on the left, and we've seen a significant amount of activity from the usual suspects who've invested in uh, ad technology, in particular uh, towards uh, programmatic. We've seen an entry of the software and data companies that have made their plays, uh, especially of, of late, and even the consumer companies, the guys with the large uh, networks that are uh, getting into the space, including a flurry of activity just in the last two weeks. So we've got IPO interest, we've got strategic interest in the category, and they're all hoping and wishing and praying uh, that we get more uh, premium. So 
Uh, premium programmatic is really, uh, I think John uh, uh, was right when he said, today you could mark the day. I mean, it's around now that we're really actually addressing this issue. You know, companies, uh, you know, popped up to start focusing on this a year, two, three years ago, um, and they were right to do so because the market has, uh, has come to them. So if you think about it, what are we trying to do with premium programmatic? Or in fact, what are we trying to do with programmatic where we can buy audiences? You're trying to uh, uh, make a change to the normal, the normal association of inventory, which is you know, tier one and tier two, which is the good stuff and the not so good stuff. As John mentioned, the word used is remnant. Um, and, and the opportunity is if there are uh, individuals who would see that ad impression that in fact would value it higher. The whole idea of this technology is to in fact improve things such that um, you, you actually pull those people out of Remnant and, and create either premium or some you know, interim uh, uh, level so that you're monetizing not at 25 cents, maybe, not at, maybe it's not 20 or $30 CPMs, but it's eight or five or 12. So you're getting a lot more um, yield from your publishers. Oh yeah, pizza, that's me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Are you Ellen? <laughs> Your name is Victor? Okay, can we have a tip for this guy? We need a tip. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, can, I, can we get a tip money here? Come on. Come on, Ellen got 200 bucks from, from uh, Weinstein. So, I mean, I'm sure you guys are good for it, right? You good? Are you happy? Should we make a video about how these guys gypped you off? No? Okay, fine. Thank you. There we go. There'll be, there'll be pizza. This is it's like the Academy Awards. Who wants pizza? Who wants pizza? Come on. Come on, if Ellen could do it, I can do it. Come, hopefully I'll do the bit better. Hers dragged on a little while. I, I've got my, uh, and later on at the end of my talk, we're doing the selfie, so get ready. Um, now think about it from the publisher standpoint, right? You've got a stack of inventory, which is you got your really good stuff at the top, right? The sponsorship stuff you pay a lot of money for. You've got your premium stuff that your sales force sells. Then is some you know, mid-layer stuff. And then all the way down to remnant at the bottom, which usually you get an ad network or, or an exchange to monetize. So this might look how the inventory stacks up. But now think about revenue, it's almost it's almost uh, uh, in the inverse. You make all your money off the little bit of inventory that's actually at the top, and you don't actually get much yield off the stuff at the bottom. Now, what does this spell? This spells opportunity, because uh, right now, I would argue that programmatic technology has largely been applied at the bottom of this inventory group, and unfortunately, only addressing a small minority of the revenue for the publisher. This is why you hear premium publishers lament the advent of, of programmatic media buying because to them, this hasn't helped. All it's done is made buy, selling the cheap stuff more efficient, but it's had a, it's had a uh, channel conflict uh, uh, problem with their more uh, premium stuff. And I would argue that we are now seeing an expansion of where technology's application is to the more uh, premium uh, inventory. And that's where I think get, things get um, excited. Uh, in fact, you, you really ought to think about premium, uh, about programmatic in, on, in two, you know, two sides of the head. You've got monetization clearly, right? And we know about those. That's the DSP, SSP exchange world which has, again, largely started in the remnant space and is moving its way up, but there's also workflow. And so the benefits of this software application to media buying is on both fronts. And I would argue that we'll make more headroom in the workflow front of some of the premium inventory uh, where, whereby uh, they will become software tools for direct sales that will help either with, uh, with forecasting, with prediction, with optimization, uh, and ultimately uh, monetization. So here's just some companies that either work the workflow side or they work the monetization side, and then you've kind of got companies in the middle that are kind of taking a workflow approach to addressing that more uh, premium uh, programmatic. So here, think of, let's think of it this way. Uh, we got the marketer on the left, we got the publisher on the right with their various tiers of inventory, and then, and, and not to mention the agency, and then 
Then we got monetization and workflow uh, columns here, where I would argue you've got right now, today, um, you know, demand comes in all forms. Some of it's uh, direct, some of it's through ad networks. Uh, much of that is through um, agencies, and some are sophisticated enough to be bidding directly on uh, exchanges. So that's where the demand's coming from. The supply is largely segregated, right? The good stuff, premium publishers are having their own Salesforce sell by hand, right? That's low operating leverage. St other stuff they relegate to ad networks um, of, of different varieties, which again is sort of hand sold. They leverage some technology, but it's still a negotiated purchase. And then finally the tier, you know, the really bottom stuff, um, uh, they're putting into uh, exchanges. And the reticence of premium publishers to put their good inventory into exchanges is, I think, because it's a relatively nascent marketplace, number one. And number two, they probably don't feel they have the necessary controls to, to limit uh, um, that sort of conflict that, that you could uh, see by having cheap inventory and expensive inventory living side by side. So then we saw the advent of the uh, private exchange. Um, you know, every SSP and exchange is sort of announcing we're doing these custom deals either with this single publisher or this group of publishers. Well, we're going to create a private exchange. Well, let's think about that, right? We've got the big room where the exchange is taking place, and they're saying, okay, premium publisher, uh, um, which basically is everyone in Germany, every publisher in Germany refuses to do an exchange, a lot of that same sentiment throughout uh, Europe, and then some of the more premium guys, remember Walker Jacobs at Turner? He wasn't wrong to be reticent at the outset to put premium inventory in there until such time as more sophisticated pricing control tools were, became available. And the temporary, and I suggest that this private uh, exchange concept is a stop, temporary stopgap measure. It makes no sense long term. You lose all of the benefits of a liquidity of a marketplace by having all these little small rooms. This one's going to do this one, and this one's going to do that. And then you've got to, what, line up individual demand into this private exchange and into that private exchange. It starts to feel like a hand-sold, negotiated media buying, right? We're going backwards with a private exchange. So I think that's a temporary phenomenon. Um, and ultimately, where we end up with, oops, that didn't change. There we go. Um, is uh, the exchanges become a more significant component uh, of media buying marketplaces. There will still be some ad networks for um, contextual buys and a variety of other things where they still have an advantage. Uh, although I do think that world shrinks and we've already seen a lot of that uh, evidence in the marketplace uh, in, the last, uh, in the last actually 12 months. It's, it's really been uh, incredible. Um, and I would argue that um, the exchanges, because of these, well, if, let's, let's, let's make it a contingent statement, if the exchanges and that whole programmatic world is able to offer the kind of premium publisher friendly controls, uh, um, that that will be necessary to attract tier one uh, and, and top quality uh, inventory uh, into those exchanges. And then, and then if you look at the workflow uh, uh, column, I actually think, and the, and the, sorry, but the, it's not a great graphic, but the program, the, the orange color, that's, you know, I don't know, is that Luma orange or Sanobi orange? Um, uh, the orange color um, is, uh, is supposed to represent the sort of um, workflow intermediation of that particular channel. And we believe that um, there are vast, f fastly developing tools on the workflow front to help uh, direct marketers, uh, or sorry, uh, uh, direct sales uh, by premium publishers. So I think this is uh, likely how we see the, uh, the marketplace uh, developing. And by the way, eh, this isn't new. Okay, we've seen this. We've seen this in other industries. If you look at financial services or travel, you have, like in advertising, demand and supply. They happen to be different, right? So in travel, for example, airlines are selling airline seats, which are perishable. Uh, in financial services, you've got listings of, of stocks. And then all these uh, different players that are bringing some level of automation to the intermediation of these marketplaces. Now, a little note here. Uh, in travel, in the 1980s, when Sabre was first introduced as a software application, a GDS that, um, that did sort of automated uh, you know, matching, uh, it was only adopted in the 80s by airlines for 
quote unquote remnant seats. And by that I mean uh, uh, if a plane was going to take off in 72 hours and they hadn't sold the seat yet, odds were they weren't going to sell the seat. You know what? That's like a house ad, right? It runs no revenue associated with it. So this, this technology identified uh, people at the last minute, when the last 72 hours, where you probably weren't going to monetize it anyways, and actually were able to generate revenue. Now, it wasn't, wasn't full price tickets. It was reduced. But it was, uh, you know, you have fixed costs. The plane was going to take off anyways. And so the way travel technology and exchanges started off was just with remnant inventory. Sound familiar? And then you saw the progression such that today, everybody's booking on Priceline and Expedia and Kayak and all these full transparency uh, um, uh, technology systems that match buyers and sellers, uh, that make it really efficient, that uh, have probably net reduced uh, prices. If any of this starts sounding familiar, uh, it's probably because it is. That is exactly how things uh, are uh, playing out in the, uh, in the advertising space. So again, this is a natural progression of an industry where software tools are being applied to either you know, workflow or monetization and usually both, um, where we're likely to see a migration from the early adopter remnant stuff all the way up to uh, premium. And um, such that, I think the, the, this is a slide we talk about in terms of the future of digital advertising. Last slide where we had, uh, uh, we had originally hand-sold premium inventory, right? All the big brand names, uh, publishers that you know. Then we developed hand-sold remnant inventory, the ad networks. Uh, later came the programmatic world, which brought a lot of data science and, and technology uh, to the space. And then finally, uh, this world, um, which is a little more amorphous than the other ones. I call it native slash social for lack of a better term. Essentially, there's a, and it's a bit of a mixed bag here. We got content uh, marketing uh, in here, vertical content, uh, social distribution. Um, and, and what's interesting is if you think of um, the, the connection, the bottom two bubbles, programmatic and the native slash social slash content, if you will, uh, uh, the bottom two bubbles feed off data. Uh, they bring a lot more science and software applications. The top guys are selling CPMs. The bottom guys are selling performance and based off data. And what's interesting is, unlike the top two bubbles, the bottom two bubbles connect to commerce. Notice that's commerce, not e-commerce. All commerce, including retail. And, and what's nice about that is that is ultimately the objective of the marketer is to sell more widgets. So if you can connect either through affiliate models, through retargeting, or even on the content side through reviews or integrated uh, content commerce models, that is a winner. And that's where I think we're uh, going with this. So uh, if you think about now premium programmatic being the overlap of that programmatic space, actually, I think it's, I think it's the whole, um, I don't know if I have a, Pointer here. Um, it's that it's that intersection in the middle where you've got programmatic and premium coming together with these new uh, uh, content formats, which are much more can be much more um, consumer friendly. So uh, with that, I gotta I gotta end with this plug. We're uh, we're in the month of March. Next month is April, and at the end of April, in fact, on April 20th is Easter Sunday. Why is that special? Well, a year ago I bid. On, uh, on, and this on Charity Buzz, Charity Buzz uh, website, they, had, um, they were running an auction, speaking of auctions, for a premium uh, placement, there we go again, um, for a walk-on role on Mad Men. And I am pleased to say that um, I was the winning bidder. And so in November, I filmed three scenes with John Hamm and will be appearing on Mad Men on Sunday, April uh, 20th. Uh, TV may never uh, be the same, but there was a problem with this. I justify this on the basis of the fact that I could probably do a lot of marketing around this. And then their lawyers made me sign this NDA. You know, in Hollywood, they keep these scripts, you know, uh, deadly secret. And I couldn't say anything about it. And I'm like, oh, you're killing me here because I was going to market this. 
And they said, yeah, yeah. And I said, wait a second, I, I think I might have found a loophole. They're like, well, what do you mean? And they said, I said, you want to protect the storyline, the plot, right? Uh, and they said, yeah, absolutely. And it's ironclad. You cannot say a word. And I said, okay, you don't want me talking about what I did on the show. That's right. But what about if I talk about what I didn't do? They're like, come again? I said, why don't if I make stuff up and talk about something that I didn't do on the show? You don't care. And they said, no, we don't care. I'm like, okay, so let's uh, watch for a Twitter campaign. I'm going to be asking for feedback on what role, what would be my ideal role if I could do it on Mad Men? Would it be A, uh, a consultant with a 1969 Loom Escape, right? That could be interesting. Um, I've actually done it, and it looks weird. Uh, a lot of blank space. Uh, B, I could be the investment banker hired to sell Sterling Cooper. That'd be kind of cool, right? Um, or C, uh, sleep with Joan. And, um, you know, amongst these three, which, I mean, which one would sort of, you know, be a better uh, marketing? I came to the conclusion that if I came in with the Lumiscape, got hired to sell, and at the closing dinner, um, slept with Joan. So D, um, all of the above would be my choice. But again, that's not up to me. Ladies and gentlemen, if you've been both informed and entertained, uh, T. Kawaja is my uh, handle. So with that, I thank you.